Hey, this is Brett the Hitman Hart, and you're watching Art 101 with Mr. Berger, and he's going to excellently execute and show you what a great video this is that highlights some of the great work by Thomas Eakins. And just know that all art is simple, and you guys can all have the potential to be the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Berger. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hart, for opening up for us today, and welcome back, scholars, to Art 101. As always, I'm Mr. Berger, a professional artist and master educator, attempting to bring you the best in art historical content. If you like this video, if you like others in the series, please make sure you consider a like, a share, a subscribe. Any interactions with the video are greatly appreciated. Without question, you have my respect. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about an American realist, Thomas Eakins. And Thomas Eakins was a huge sports fanatic, and his favorite sport was wrestling. So I think we've got to get a little bit deeper into the vibe so we can really discuss Thomas Eakins. So, that's right, now we can get to work talking about one of the greatest artists in American history, one of my absolute favorites, Thomas Eakins. American scholar Walt Whitman once said, I never knew but of one artist, that is Tom Eakins. Who could resist the temptation to see what they think ought to be rather than what is? Eakins is not a painter, he is a force. Thomas Eakins was a great American artist and teacher. Many consider him the greatest American realist of his generation. He was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and his father was an ornamental writer and educator. After high school, he was taking classes at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, but was largely disappointed with his advancement in realistic rendering of people. It don't take a whole lot to get in there. I guess you have to be able to, the entrance exam, you have to be able to write your name in three different colors of crayon. So he began to take some anatomy classes at the Jefferson Medical College, and after some five years of doing this, he set off in search of artistic knowledge. He would go to Europe and study under French painter and sculptor Jean-Léon Ginoma, as well as French portrait painter Léon Bonnat. Through his travels, he became very much influenced by the works of the Spanish artists such as Diego Velázquez and Giuseppe di Ribera. Now, Eakins' study at the Jefferson Medical College would become the subject of one of his most popular paintings. Because it's embedded in my skull! It's embedded in my heart! And it's embedded in every nightmare! While studying anatomy, he observed the surgeries of Dr. Samuel David Gross. The painting, The Gross Clinic, was of Dr. Gross as the main figure in the surgery auditorium, where students are observing him perform a surgery on a leg. Another of his more famous works is William Rush carving his angelic figure of the Skullkill River. This strongly side-lit painting has a composition that centers on the female figure. One of the major influences in Eakins creating this work was Gustav Courbet and his painter's studio, which we have talked about on two occasions. Look down in the links below, and you can find the links to my discussions on those paintings. But, moving forward... I'm not here to help young kids learn... Some have given this work some pretty harsh criticisms because of its unfinished look and its very rough texture throughout the majority of the work. But the look of this was very much intended. As a matter of fact, this work was one of the most planned and studied for works that Eakins would ever create. He would create sketches, paintings, and sculptures to aid him in the process of creating this final work. I feel that this work is very important because we see his passionate belief that all art, painted or sculpted, must begin first with a human form. Now, After three years of studying in Europe, he set up a studio and began to share his knowledge with others as an educator. 
Although he was very much influenced by his European travels, he would admit that it is well to go abroad and see the works of the old masters, but Americans must strike out for ourselves, and only by doing this will we create a great and distinctively American art. He most notably liked the works of Leonardo da Vinci that he would encounter. Because like da Vinci, he also had a gift and a fascination with learning about art and science. Everybody needs to have something to live for each day. This combination of art and science, for some crazy reason, has brought innovation and controversy to both of these artists. Now what do I know? I color for a living, but I can tell you that Thomas Eakins would change the way art instruction would take place. Here's why. Teaching at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, Eakins expanded the art curriculum to include several unique components, although they proved to be very effective. First, deeply influenced by his time at the Jefferson Medical College, would add cadaver dissection into the anatomical study for the artists. He felt that artists were on the same level as doctors, both having equal rights to dissection of the dead. Humans as well as lions, dogs, cats, and horses were all anatomically studied and used for the creation of plaster casts. Needless to say, the public was very upset by this practice. We almost tore the building down! His next big move was to add a photography class. This was helpful to students, but when he began taking nude photographs of the students, as well as himself for the studies, the public was outraged. Could you imagine today an art teacher taking nude photographs of themselves as well as their students for the study of art? It would be the end of the road for that art teacher, I guarantee you. Anyway, I digress. In terms of the photo shoot, this was a boys only thing, so the school let it slide. The most radical component that he added was allowing live nude models in the classroom. It was accepted until he began to use the male nude models in his classes that also had female students. Again, the public was beyond outraged at this. After teaching for 10 years, he was forced to resign. Although maybe outside of the realm of appropriate for the time, the processes were correct and the best way to learn to become a knowledgeable artist. It is fair to say that Eakin's ideas would reshape art education. Most of the male art students would quit and begin the Art Students League in Philadelphia, with Eakins as their unpaid instructor for the next seven years. Eakins' most celebrated student to emerge from this period of time was Henry O. Tanner, who was a phenomenal artist that I'm sure we'll talk about at another point. Yay! Now, during his years as an educator, Eakins would work on a drawing manual based on his lectures. After he was fired, he never finished the project. However, in 2005, the Yale Press and the Pennsylvania Museum of Art published the work, and this allows the modern student the opportunity to read his lectures, illustrated by his pen and ink drawings, and gives us a slice of what it was to be a student in his classroom. As a matter of fact, I have this book in my own library. In the book, he covers the principles and the methods of three drawing systems, linear perspective, mechanical drawing, and isometric drawing. Because of the issues that Eakins had with the public, he would spend his later years of his career in isolation from the public. The commissioned work was rare, and he was unable to make any real good money off of his skills. At the invitation of one of his doctor friends, he goes off to stay at the BT Ranch off the edge of the Badlands in the Little Missouri Territory, which is now North Dakota. Basically, he would go for a vacation and a little bit of relaxation. Now, he would stay for a relatively short time and then return back to Pennsylvania. But during this time, he would reflect on the fact that he was the most skilled artist around, but he was having a hard time showcasing that artwork. No painting that he had ever created allowed him to have the ability to be truly recognized as the definitive master or, or any sort of huge financial gains. It would not be until the end of his life that he was seen as an artistic master. That hurts our feelings. Thomas Eakins was a painter, sculptor, teacher, and photographer. 
He was interested in representing the world as realistically as possible, and so photography became a very appealing process to Eakins. He was exploring the media as early as 1881 to improve the images in his paintings. He takes his camera with him to New Jersey to take some photographs that would be used as source material for some paintings, and this is the first example of the photograph replacing the sketch. The year of 1902 saw some major shifts in Eakins' work. He was elected to become an associate for the National Academy of Design and quickly became a full academian and had to offer work to present as a diploma painting. He chose to present The Wrestlers. Talking about history, talking about history. One of my favorites. In The Wrestlers, Eakins focuses on the American culture, human form, and portraiture that are all evident in his paintings. Some even believe that this is a symbolic self-portrait. This idea was reached because Eakins often places symbols from the personally traumatic events in his life into his works. The painting is quite important to Eakins' history because it would be the last genre painting, the last male nude, and his last sporting painting. Let me leave you with this. Eakins had battled in his art and teaching careers and struggled to earn recognition for his talents. In this way, perhaps, this painting parallels his own struggles as he nears the end of his life. As I've mentioned before, Eakins was a huge sports lover, making many, many artworks about subjects of various sports. Beyond wrestling, other sport-related subjects were swimmers, boxers, baseball players, hunters, fishermen, chess players, artists, and beyond. Whatever. One of his great quotes that I really identify with is, to strain your brain more than your eye. What a great line. <laughs> I love that story for life. <laughs>